FUD. Good morning. I'm in the Rose Garden at the Legislature on the traditional territory of the Lekwungen speaking people, the Songhees and the Squamalt First Nation. And I want to start today by, uh, again, congratulating British Columbians on all the hard work we've been doing together to bend the curve and to allow us to open up our economy more fully, allow us to travel around BC freely. However, after observing uh, footage from Kelowna, after observing footage of a drum uh, circle uh, in the Lower Mainland, I have to say to British Columbians, come on, you're better than that. We need bigger spaces and fewer faces. We need to make sure that we're respecting not just our own space, but other people's space. We're only going to be able to defeat this if we do it together. The challenge ahead of us is enormous. COVID-19 is still very much in our community and we have a collective responsibility to do what we can to defeat it. We've made better progress than anyone in Canada up until the past couple of weeks. My appeal to all of you, young and old, be responsible, do your best to stay away from other people. If you can't physical distance, wear a mask. Keep going on the personal hygiene that we've been working on so, so effectively by washing your hands, making sure that if you're sick, you stay indoors. And if we do that, we'll be able to continue to open the economy so all British Columbians can benefit from that. I want to touch on a couple of issues that we've been working on over the past week, and then I'll be happy to take questions. Firstly, I want to talk about the rapid response from the federal government on my appeal to do something about not just our land border, not just our airports, but also our marine highways connecting British Columbia with uh, Washington State. I have zero problem with boaters staying in the water off the shores of British Columbia, but if you're going to dock in British Columbia, if you're not an essential traveler, you're not allowed to do that. The federal government's responded with hefty fines for Americans who do come into Canadian waters without identifying the appropriate authorities, and those fines are severe, and I'm grateful that the federal government responded so quickly to my appeal. I also want to touch on um, the progress we've been making with childcare. Uh, the minister responsible had a press conference yesterday. What we've learned from the pandemic is childcare is not a social program. It's an economic imperative to ensure that we have everyone fully participating in the economy. W women, men, families need to have confidence that their children are being cared for. British Columbia had been making great progress before the pandemic. And I think it's time for us to double down now to make sure we're increasing more spaces, training more early childhood educators so that we can have a robust, accessible, quality, affordable childcare system here in British Columbia. Again, another issue where the federal government has recognized that they have a good outcome when they work with provinces that are prepared to invest in issues that make a difference in people's lives. Childcare is the best thing we can do for young families to make sure that they can fully participate in the economy. I want to talk about uh, the billion dollars uh, that has been added to our recovery plan uh, by Minister James. That money is going to be cost shared with the federal government on important services provided by municipalities, whether it be rec centres, libraries, uh, whatever uh, the, the shortfall in revenues have been to municipalities, the province and the federal government are going to work together to fill those gaps to provide services for people. The biggest part of that, of course, is public transit whether it be BC Transit or TransLink. We've had a significant drop off in ridership. We know it's critical to our success on climate action that we get more people out of single occupancy vehicles and into public transit. We need to make sure that that's affordable for people. We need to make sure it's affordable for municipalities as well. So we're going to cost share 50-50 with the federal government to meet those challenges. And that's why we've uh, allocated another billion dollars to the restart plan. Lastly, I want to say thank you to the thousands of people who participated in our survey about recovery, whether through the online uh, mechanism or through town hall meetings over the past number of weeks. We've had a very positive response with a lot of good ideas. Cabinet and government have been working on all of the information that we've been getting from sectoral leaders, from individual businesses, from regular people across British Columbia to put in place a dynamic plan that meets the needs of British Columbians right now and into the fall. These are challenging times, ladies and gentlemen. This, this is not something that we've ever contemplated before. It's 100 years since the last pandemic. There was no guidebook in my desk when I arrived. But what I've seen over the past number of months is British Columbians coming together to defeat this virus. We've seen better outcomes than any other jurisdiction in Canada. Just this week, we've seen an increase in our, weekly, or in our daily uh, caseloads. 
Dr. Henry's talked about that and talked about her concerns. She shared those concerns with me and I realized that we need to be going in the other direction, but I think it's also important that we compare ourselves to our neighbors. The average case load over the past week in British Columbia has been 30, and, uh, 30 every day. In uh, Washington state, the average has been 829 new cases every day. In Alberta, 116 new cases every day. Those are trends that are not good for our neighbors and they're not good for British Columbians. We need to look around us so that we can modify our behavior to protect our loved ones, to make sure that we can continue to reopen the economy safely as we go from phase three into phase four in the weeks or potentially months ahead. These are important issues. I know all British Columbians are focused on them. I'm happy to take any questions you might have. A reminder to reporters on the line, please press star one to enter the queue. If you've already pressed it, press it again, just to make sure I see your name. Our first question will be from Vaughn Palmer. Good morning, Premier. Thank you for taking my question. The showing of that uh, video of the drum ceremony at Third Beach occasioned a round of buck passing from a lot of authorities saying they were concerned but didn't see that they could do anything about it. Does the province have anything, any ability to do anything about such events if they continue? And will the province do something? Well, thanks for the question, Vaughn. And, and uh, certainly there are uh, tools at our disposal but where we've had success over the past number of months is appealing to British Columbians to do the right thing. Other jurisdictions uh, as you know uh, put in place fines early on. Uh, that's not the approach that we took. We believe that particularly when it comes to outdoor activities whether it be uh, the protests around Black Lives, Matter, Black Lives Matter which are very important for British Columbians to participate in. Uh, there was no value in us saying anything other than keep your distance, do your best to wear a mask and behave responsibly. And that message has been our uh, beginning and middle and end to this point in time. And I say to the drummers there's lots of coastline in British Columbia. There's lots of places for you to gather in smaller groups to uh, indulge your musical creativity or do anything else you may want to do but do it responsibly. That's the approach we've taken, Vaughn, and that's the approach we'll continue to take going forward. Vaughn, do you have a follow-up? Yes, please. Um, Premier, we've heard some concerns from uh, business leaders, uh, small business people and others here in the provincial capital region who find themselves next to one of these hotels that the province has taken over and put homeless people in. Uh, they've been expressing concern about the impact on their business, their customers, break-ins. Uh, mentioned the Dodd family just because they're so prominent here in the capital. Um, do you have any sympathy for them, and do you think they're entitled to any sort of redress or compensation from the province? Certainly, I, I am very uh, sympathetic to the concerns of British Columbians when they feel that their rights uh, have been uh, intruded upon by decisions that governments have made, whether they be municipal, federal, or provincial. The challenge is always to try and find that balance between respecting the rights of individuals and taking care of collective issues that all of us have a responsibility to deal with. The homelessness crisis in British Columbia, not just in Victoria, not just in Vancouver, but indeed across BC, is, is stark and we need to take action. I'm very proud of the work that we've been able to do uh, to house thousands of people over the past number of years and the numbers continue to grow of people who need housing. The pandemic has not been our friend in this regard. Uh, facilities that used to be able to house people overnight are no longer suitable because of physical distance, and distance requirements, which has seen a proliferation of encampments. We're working as hard as we can to respect uh, the rights and, and the needs of people in communities. We're also working with local government. We're working with the federal government to try and find solutions to these vexing problems. But if there's no magic solution or we would have already tried it. Uh, do I uh, absolutely have sympathy for the Dodds and others uh, who are pillars in the community? Of course I do. But they, among all of the people that I know, understand that only working together are we going to be able to solve these issues. Our next question is from Tanya Fletcher. Hi, Premier. Uh, the situation in Kelowna stems from people traveling there from other places in many cases. Is there a contemplation of backing off of your, your travel, you know, BC messaging that was launched with this latest phase? And I guess overall, how concerned are you uh, about people saying that maybe we opened too quickly or too early? 
I don't. I don't believe we open too quickly. Uh, our our numbers, our, our daily uh, case counts, uh, when we moved to phase three, were very low. Some days single digit. Uh, again, uh, the envy of Canada in that regard. Uh, Dr. Henry's work uh, with uh, local officials, her work with uh, federal uh, health authorities has also been, been very helpful to us. We said from the beginning that mobility rights in Canada were fundamental and if people wanted to come to British Columbia, they're welcome, but they needed to do, from other parts of Canada, but they needed to do so mindful that they were coming to someone else's neighborhood, someone else's community, and they should behave as they would expect others to behave when they came to their neighborhood and to their community. So I don't believe we started uh, too soon. I think our timing was about right. We did anticipate an increase in caseload because there's an increase uh, in interactions with people, but that doesn't mean that you can be reckless. And uh, some of the images I've seen in Kelowna, and look, it took me back to my youth. Uh, my buddies from here on the island would go to the Okanagan to enjoy the uh, good hospitality and spectacular weather and uh, great beaches at Skaha and Okanagan. Uh, so I know what's going on here. I've got young uh, men in my life who would also uh, like to travel and enjoy a good time. But you need to do that in smaller groups. You need to do that with people that you know. It's not the time to make new friends, it's the time to reinforce the relationships you do have. And again, it's not forever, it's just for now. But we cannot go back to just uh, regular interactions uh, randomly. We need to be able to trace and contact those that we've come into contact with. And, and that just doesn't happen when you're having massive parties on the beach or massive uh, drumming events. This is not the right way to go. And I'm appealing to British Columbians to use their good sense and don't get together in large groups with people you don't know. That's a recipe for your personal disaster that could then spread to your family, to your loved ones, to your grandparents. Do you have a follow-up? Yes, thank you. Um, the amended orders Dr. Henry announced yesterday are, are uh, focused on nightlife, you know, no dance floors, no mingling at bars. Uh, but given that a lot of the recent spread, you know, may have started with private parties in hotels or resorts or social gatherings at venues that can be rented out, even uh, houseboats, should there be more of a focus on restrictions specific to those areas? And, and I guess how tricky is that logistically when we're talking about tourism? Well, it's not just about tourism. It's about uh, just personal interactions. Uh, we have an ability to regulate uh, activities by businesses where they open their doors for commercial purposes and invite people in. And uh, Dr. Henry has been working uh, and her team have been working with uh, uh, the sector. I, uh, I, the, certainly the, the hospitality, restaurant, food and beverage sector has been very responsive and very attentive to the need to make sure that their uh, businesses can continue to operate successfully for themselves, for their employees and for their patrons. Uh, so I believe it's appropriate that we tweak those uh, recommendations from health authorities as we see the need. When it comes to personal activity in private places, that's where we have to appeal to people's common sense and their general decency and their respect for their neighbours and their loved ones. That's what we're doing today, that's what I'm trying to do today, and that's what Dr. Henry's been doing from the beginning. We don't believe in penalising people for personal behaviour. We, uh, we prefer instead to ask them to behave better. Uh, act responsibly in your interest and the interest of the people around you. Our next question is from Richard Zisman. Oh, on that point, Premier, how do you speak directly to young people? You know, in your opening comments and just to your answer to Tanya, you speak to all British Columbians. But obviously, when you looked at that footage in Kelowna and at Third Beach, there were commonalities in terms of the age of people there. So, it, you know, come on, man. I don't think it's enough of a message to a 20 year old to change their behavior. Well, when, you're, when you're, your buddies uh, uh, contract COVID-19, that gets your attention pretty quickly. And we've seen a spike in cases. We've seen now uh, many, many British Columbians in isolation because of the contacts that they have had. That word spreads through communities pretty quickly. Young people uh, are, are certainly cognizant of what their peers are doing. They're gonna be using social media to say, uh, this is what's happened to me. Use your common sense. I, I just do not believe that a uh, that prescribing behavior uh, and penalizing people for bad behavior is where we're at right now. I think that uh, we've got a lot of summer ahead of us. We've got an opportunity for people to give themselves a bit of a shake and act better, and we'll see how that goes. Uh, uh, responding to the first question, we do have tools at our disposal. We're reluctant to use them because other jurisdictions have tried and failed. 
quite frankly, and, and we would prefer British Columbians who tune in to these uh, regular updates, either from me or from Dr. Henry or from Minister Dix, and they're responding. And peer pressure from parents, uh, from other uh, young people, I believe is a better way forward, and that's why I'm appealing uh, to those who recognize the risk that people are taking to tell their friends, hey man, this is bad behavior, we shouldn't do this. Let's find some other way to have some fun. There's no shortage of opportunities for fun in British Columbia. Let's do it in bigger spaces with fewer faces. Richard, do you have a follow-up? I do. Is there any part of you that wants to step up and play bad cop and, and allow Dr. Henry to be the good cop and you step up and say enough is enough and, and you know, provide the young people a little bit of a lecture? Well, I guess I'm doing that right now, and I'm doing it in a way that I would talk to my own uh, children, who are now in, uh, in their, just in their 30s. And uh, I appeal to their common sense and uh, how they were brought up. Uh, respect other people. This is what it's really all about at the end of the day. Don't be reckless, because that recklessness can have an impact on other people. Down the line, with many, many contacts away from you, quite frankly. So if you're going to have a party, you're going to have some fun, keep it to the people that you know. If someone from outside of your group, outside of your bubble, uh, is participating, uh, keep your distance. You don't know where those people have been, and those people could have touched thousands of other people that could put you at risk. These are pretty basic issues. People need to understand there are consequences. Young people are not immune. Young people are not invincible. All of us are in this together. Adults, children, and youth, and we all need to act responsibly. Our next question is from Binder Sajjan. Go ahead, Binder. Okay, well, we're gonna move to Lisa Yuzda. Lisa, are you there? Oh. I am. I'm here. I'm here. Go ahead. Premier, you said you don't believe it's time to penalize now, but I'm wondering when is it? Like, when does the we'll see how it goes approach stop? Well, as I said, uh, comparatively, uh, 30 cases on average a day over the past week versus 800 some in Washington state and 115, 120 in Alberta tells me that we are in a pretty good space. We did anticipate an increase in cases because of the increase in interactions. Uh, and quite frankly, uh, we're going to keep the numbers probably around this level and Dr. Henry is uh, better uh, uh, able to advise you on when is the right time. The, the relationship we have with public health officials here is that the cabinet makes decisions based on advice and information that we get from public health. When Dr. Henry believes we're at that point, she'll give that advice, we'll deliberate it over and make a decision. Right now, I'm with her and she's with me. We believe that we can appeal to people to act better because we've done so well to this point in time. Let's not throw all that away, not just for ourselves, not just for our families, but for the whole province. Do you have a follow up, Lisa? I do. So I'm hearing, I think it's fair to say that you're concerned. So looking at the next, you know, month and a bit of warm weather, what are your biggest worries over this next period of time before we sort of get back to business as the new normal come the fall? Well, we are, we are in the middle of July. Uh, people are, uh, many, many British Columbians are uh, enjoying uh, provincial campsites. They're visiting communities that they haven't been to in a while or maybe have never been to at all, all without incident. Uh, the issues and events in Kelowna have certainly seen a spike in cases and a, a spike in concern from public health officials. Uh, we've been working with uh, the mayor of Kelowna and people on the ground in Kelowna to get that message out. Operators of resorts have to act responsibly as well. That is an area where we do have regulatory abilities and, and we have done that. Uh, Dr. Henry has increased uh, some of the restrictions with respect to uh, nightclubs and so on. So we'll keep monitoring it and uh, taking the steps that we believe are in the best interest of British Columbians. But at this point, uh, it's steady as she goes. Uh, again, appealing to British Columbians uh, to act responsibly, use your common sense. If you can't uh, physical distance, wear a mask. And for goodness sakes, if you're sick, do not go out. Do not go to work. Our next question is from Amy Smart. Hi, Premier. Um, yesterday, uh, Rob Fleming suggested that there would be a full return to classes. I'm wondering, you know, with these numbers increasing, um, how are you going to give parents the certainty they need to plan while protecting their children? 
Well, it's a very good question. And, and again, I, I, I'm grateful for it because there was an appeal in the legislature from opposition members last week demanding to know today what's going to happen in September. And I think most reasonable people know that uh, Minister Fleming and all of the stakeholders in the K-12 system, teachers, administrators, trustees, parents, are working as hard as they can to make sure that everyone's safe. That's my f overwhelming preoccupation. My plan is to make sure that we get it right, not that we get it done by a certain time. Minister Fleming uh, gave uh, some initial uh, preliminary uh, comments yesterday. He's still working with officials. We'll have more to say as the month winds down. But we're going to be monitoring this right up until September. And I think most parents understand that. They should plan uh, to assume that we're going to be going back to school, but they should have a secondary plan. I think that's reasonable to ask parents to be patient. And I know that the vast majority want us to get it right. They don't want us to get it done. funding announced yesterday. I'm wondering if you can clarify where that will come from and whether that affects the um, 12.5 billion estimate, estimated deficit. The Minister uh, James has attached that to her budget estimates. Uh, they'll be debated uh, in the legislature, I believe, next week or the week after. Uh, and that'll be where uh, the transparency of where the resources will come from and where they will go. But we, uh, we worked very hard with the federal government on their restart plan. We put our priorities on the table. Uh, we were able to come away with a federally funded uh, paid sick leave program, which is going to be so critically important to us come the fall when the flu season is upon us, uh, colds are going to be around, and of course COVID will still be here. That was an enormous win for Canadians, and I'm grateful the federal government recognized that. On uh, the transit issues, uh, we started with a small fund that was going to be shared by the major transit using provinces, Ontario, Quebec, and British Columbia, and Alberta. Uh, and the federal government recognized that uh, Ontario alone uh, needed twice as much as was on the table because of the size of their population and the sophistication of their public transit systems. So that is now open-ended and we're going to match dollar for dollar to make sure that we can keep the system going without putting more uh, burden on local uh, users or local governments. The next question is from Tom Fletcher. Uh, hi, Premier. Uh, I'm hearing these days that uh, Plan A for the fall is uh, for some tightening of restrictions as uh, school resumes and people who are spending a lot more time indoors. Is that something that people should be prepared for? Oh, absolutely. People should be thinking about uh, what, the, what the future holds for them as individuals and as communities. Uh, our our uh, plan is to continue to monitor and ask people to behave appropriately, uh, keep in small groups wherever possible. Uh, when we move into the fall and the weather starts to turn uh, uh, less seasonal, I guess, uh, to what we have today, we're going to have to have new and, and different ways of approaching the challenges in the workplace, in communities and within families. Uh, but it's premature, I think, for us to talk about that now. But people should be uh, thinking about it for sure. Follow up. Uh, mask restrictions, is that uh, something we, we haven't uh, seen too much of? Uh, does that become, uh, does that move up the priority list in the fall? Well, I, I believe that uh, people are responding when they're in smaller groups, uh, they're wearing masks. I think certainly when you're traveling uh, on public transit, it's a really good idea to do that. If you can't physical distance, it's the appropriate way to go, not necessarily to protect yourself from others, but protect uh, them from you. That's uh, the overwhelming science on the question. Dr. Henry has uh, been given direction and guidance on that and I'll adhere to that until she changes her course. But for me, uh, it's all about uh, how big is the space I'm in and how many people are around me. And if it's not enough space, I'll put on my mask. If it is, uh, I'm going without it when I'm outdoors. Uh, and when I'm indoors, that changes as well. Next question is from Rob Shaw. Oh, hi, uh, Premier. Uh, you've been trying to convince Ottawa now for months to provide some federal financial aid for BC Ferries. You get uh, a bunch of money put on the table last week. Ferries isn't included. What's going on there? Um, what are you going to do about it? And how much longer can you wait if you're going to be providing assistance to the other transit systems in BC before you have to find provincial money for BC Ferries so they don't uh, face the same fare and uh, route difficulties? Yeah. Well, we're uh, continuing to discuss uh, that package of dollars uh, with the federal government. Why I, I highlighted the fact that it went from a fixed amount to an open-ended amount for public transit was for that very reason. Uh, Minister Freeland and I have talked at, at length 
about the importance of BC ferries to British Columbia. Coastal communities absolutely depend on our marine highway. Uh, she understands that and uh, we're working on mechanisms to allow us to access those federal dollars. We're not done on that yet. Do you have a follow up, Rob? Sure, Can I just, I'm going to ask you about a different uh, topic here, but we have seen a series of opinion polls now over the last few weeks and months saying your popularity is at an all-time high, as is that of your party. If we were to have an election, uh, you would likely win a majority government. I know we're in the middle of a pandemic, and it may be one of the last things on your mind, but I'm sure there are supporters and people in your party to, trying to suggest to you ways to have an early election. What are you saying to them uh, and is there any scenario in which we in the province go to the polls before next October? Well, I've, we are a minor, minority government. Uh, we have been uh, a day away from an election for the past three years. And that's been my message to my colleagues in the legislature. That's been my message to supporters of the NDP. That's been my message to the public. We're working hard every day to meet the needs of people. That's why I got involved in politics. That's why I'm uh, very proud and honoured and humbled to have the opportunity to be Premier of British Columbia. And I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing as long as I have the support uh, of the legislature. We have a very, very uh, precarious balance here in BC. And, and I've said uh, that between now and next fall, we need to have an election. It's uh, mandated uh, by, by next October. And so there's an opportunity this fall. There's an opportunity next spring. There's an opportunity next summer. Uh, when that happens uh, is not necessarily clear to me today. What is clear to me is that the legislature is sitting. We have uh, stimulus dollars that we're discussing with cabinet how to spend uh, to keep the economy going and to focus on making sure people have the services that they need. That's my number one preoccupation, whether we're in a pandemic or not. We only have time for one more question, and that's going to be from Omar Sajadina. Premier, good morning. I just want to switch gears a little bit. Is there an update or response to the letter you wrote to the Prime Minister supporting calls to decriminalize small amounts of controlled substances? First, Omar, I think this is the first time you've ever asked me a question. I've always been an admirer, longtime fan, first time answerer. Uh, I have not yet had an answer from the, the Prime Minister. Uh, I've spoken uh, in, in some detail with uh, Minister Freeland about this. That's been the approach that we've taken in federal provincial discussions so far. She has been very accessible. She understands the issues. Minister Eby is talking with his opposite number, the Minister of Justice, about this tomorrow. I believe Minister Farnworth uh, has talked to uh, Bill Blair, the Public Safety Minister, already. If he hasn't, he will do that by the end of the week. Our, our ask to the federal government is uh, to take a good hard look at the National Police Chief's recommendations and implement that as quickly as we can. We need to do everything we can to get these numbers down in British Columbia. We need to, as Judy Darcy has been doing, creating new spaces for recovery beds and other issues. We've got legislation in the House right now to protect youth. Uh, that are at risk from addictions and opioid, uh, potential opioid overdoses. Uh, these are all uh, issues that we've been working on for the past number of years. The pandemic has highlighted how big this challenge is. Uh, we are now seeing more people alone and isolated, and uh, that's where we're seeing the, the, the increase in deaths because people are not congregating any longer in, in larger groups or in, in clusters. They're, they're alone. Uh, when, the, when they find themselves in a place where the overdoses are occurring and losses of life are a result. We need to do more. We need the federal government on our side. Omar, do you have a follow-up? Yes, just a quick one. And, Premier, thanks for that update. Just as a follow-up, you know, as you pointed out in the letter, you've got a situation now where even uh, law enforcers in this country are calling for laws around drugs to be relaxed, and yet you've got the federal government that brands itself as being progressive, it's it's not budging. Why do you, why do you think the federal government is dragging its feet on this? Well, I think that uh, we're going to see some progress here. That's my hope. Uh, that's uh, I get that indication from uh, Minister Freeland. She takes back uh, not just with British Columbia, but uh, premiers across the country. We've had. Uh, 20 consecutive weeks. I think this is the first week we haven't had a, a meeting slated between premiers and the federal government uh, because of the success we had with the restart announcement last week. Uh, we're taking a bit of a summer uh, hiatus, but you know, rust doesn't sleep, nor does the pandemic, uh, nor does the opioid crisis in British Columbia. So we're pushing hard to get federal action this summer, and I'm hopeful we'll see that. We are also uh, just beginning the first review of the Police Act in 45 years. 
a, a nonpartisan or all party uh, committee of the legislature is going to be looking at modernizing policing. Uh, the police uh, uh, unions are very happy about that. Leadership is very happy about that. We've been asking law enforcement to do more than they can. Uh, we need to make sure that we're putting resources into the issues that we need to and, and addressing the mental health and addictions is something that we started on by establishing the first standalone ministry three years ago and now we need again to continue working with the federal government so that all orders of government are focused on this challenge. Thank you everyone, that's all the time we have.